I see trade as this thing that opens up not just a richer world, but a world that is more interactive, where people have to start learning what each other is like. I mean, the first um, American basketball or football team to actually take a um, black American player was owned by one of the biggest racists in America. But he did it because he made money. And he looked past his prejudices, as bad as they were, because he could actually profit. So this is, we, we keep saying profit's a dirty word, but women start getting into the community and, and earning because profit. Minorities because of profit. Profit is maligned by those who are already there and don't want competition. Now my show is an intelligence test, okay? So if you watch my show, I know that you're smart. And that's because stupid people don't understand my show. And my show looks like nonsense from a crazy person. So if you can understand my show, I know you're smart. What matters in Bitcoin is people. How close can you get to someone? And, and as we get more connected in this world, the distance becomes smaller. And that distance is important. The smaller the distance, the more connected we are, the closer we are to everyone. If, every, if, if we have an intelligence test and we know who's smart and who's dumb, that means the smart people can congregate together. Connectivity in Bitcoin is incentivized. And I first got interested in Craig Wright because I know that he watches my show. Now, in Bitcoin, it, it really is about understanding Bitcoin. Okay, that's, and, and in order to understand Bitcoin, you have to be like a theoretical physicist. So, like when I first read A Brief History of Time, I didn't really know physics. Um, and I remember reading something like, all this seems fairly straightforward, but the remarkable fact is that there are particles that do not look the same if one turns them through just one revolution. You have to turn them through two complete revolutions. Such particles are said to have spin one half. What? So later when I learned physics, I, I figured out that this is like a terrible way of explaining spinners. Something that is not infinite, but unbounded. Now in a hypothetical computer, the concept of saying it's not Turing complete because it can't compute an infinite number, it's uh, rather crazy when you think about it because you can't ever compute an infinite number. So Craig Wright is like Stephen Hawking. And this is the key at the heart of this. A Turing complete machine is a machine that can compute any computable number. So I know that uh, he knows he knows what Turing completeness is, but somebody who is listening would not know what Turing completeness is. There are interests in Bitcoin that have reason to lie about Bitcoin, right? Uh, so uh, you it is it it is your responsibility to understand Bitcoin, okay? And uh, so if somebody is talking nonsense about Bitcoin, um, it's other people's responsibility to recognize that as nonsense. There is no split. You split, we bankrupt you. This is how Bitcoin works. If you don't like it, stiff. So why do you do an intelligence test? Because... Connectivity in Bitcoin is incentivized. So if you know more, and you are able to perform intelligence tests, you can use that to figure out who to be connected to. Because you can figure out who is smart, and you want to be connected to the smart people. A serious large-scale miner will spend well over $100 million setting up a system right now. And the concept that those miners are going to spend to get a little tiny bit of profit um, to do something like a selfish mining attack, to take a bribe for a double spend, that is just asinine. If you think about it for a second, people talk about the miner could take a small percentage of a sale to include a double spent transaction. So say we have our 10% miner. 
someone who owns 10% of the total hash rate. They've probably spent for that amount between 75 and $100 million in infrastructure. Infrastructure that has a usable lifespan of maybe 18 months to two years. They have that period to not only regain, but to totally replace their inventory, their capital. So that's a lot of money they have to earn and replace. So let's start thinking about what that means. To be successful, that miner needs to have a robust ecosystem. The value of the coin and market is most secure, is highest, and will rise when people know that it's safe. So if that miner starts doing things like taking small bribes to help someone steal a coffee, that miner is going to actually undercut their own incentives. Okay, now that was the important part of the video, the part that we just heard. If everybody understood that, that would be a lot better. That would be a lot better for everyone. Okay? But how do you convince people? How do you how do you get people to see that that's what's important? This a Turing complete machine is a machine that can compute any computable number. So something like this can function as an intelligence test because you can recognize that it's like the Stephen Hawking version of Turing completeness, or you can say that it is the ravings of a crazy person. See, it's your responsibility to know what Turing completeness is. If you want to know, go outside of Bitcoin, read a computer science book, okay? It is your responsibility to know what is important. So there's another thing in Bitcoin that I call the know-it-all competition. And uh, this is something that uh, affects people who want to be prominent in Bitcoin. Um, uh, p people who want to be prominent but don't understand how, I should say. So the know-it-all competition means that people have to prove their knowledge all the time in order to be uh, prominent in Bitcoin. And that is bullshit. And people who believe in the know-it-all competition don't understand Bitcoin. So one of the things I do is show, show a lot of contempt for the know-it-all competition. And uh, if people ask me to prove that I know something, uh, I, uh, I make a joke or something. See, that to somebody who knows that the know-it-all competition is bullshit, that is a sign that I also know that it's bullshit, okay? But it is not, uh, it's not something that everybody understands. It's, it's something that reveals who is thinking and who isn't. So that's one thing that I like about Craig Wright is that he fails the know-it-all competition. And in fact, he goes further because he makes ridiculous claims about himself, which he then refuses to back up, claims that people would be curious about. The history my finances, all the rest. But really, how would you feel if I came up to you and said, excuse me, what's your credit card debt at the moment? How much is your home loan? How much are you earning? What are you worth? How much did you spend on entertainment? Do I have a, a valid reason to ask any of that? I know people want to know these things, I don't care. And no, I know what people say about signing things. And the blog post I released didn't make any promises. The Sartre piece didn't make any promises there. I said, I know how to, I know everything, and I'm not going to give you any answers. So what did I see after this video came out where Craig Wright said that a Turing complete machine can compute any computable number? Well, I saw that Amory Sachet had written a takedown of the video on Reddit. And, uh... I tried to find this again, but I couldn't, so maybe somebody can point me to it and I'll link to it below. So this was the moment when I was like, uh, clearly Craig Wright's understanding of Bitcoin is uh, light years beyond Amory's, because here is uh, Amory, uh, a person who uh, presumably would want uh, miners to adopt his scaling plan, who is sort of doing uh, a takedown of a miner uh, 
on Reddit. So he's talking to people on Reddit and trying to win points with them, trying to win the know-it-all competition, and he's kind of, uh, kind of not, not treating somebody who does matter like, like someone who he would like to uh, convince that his scaling plan is better. And also, he, he didn't seem to see that, uh, that Craig Wright knew what a Turing machine is. So, and so here's me thinking as an investor, thinking like, what is going to convince me to split old UTXOs to sell uh, BTC for BCH? Certainly not a developer who has no idea who his audience is, because to me that was the big problem that we had with BTC. The best answer to corruption is sunshine. If you want to make this global, then you have to engage globally. Connectivity in Bitcoin is incentivized. So Craig Wright is also looking around to see who is thinking. So I started thinking about what is Enchain? Okay. What what is the company? Well they're miners, right? A lot of money they have to earn and replace. So let's start thinking about what that means. And they want to get transaction fees. Okay, so how do we get transaction fees? I see trade as this thing that opens up not just a richer world, but a world that is more interactive where people have to start learning what each other is like. You split, we bankrupt you. This is how Bitcoin works. So I've been saying we need a brain, right? That was what my last episode was about. Uh, and I was I was kind of imagining like a Hayekian spontaneous order kind of thing. A serious large-scale miner will spend well over a hundred million dollars setting up a system right now. Now I'm seeing that I really should have got into mining a lot earlier because there are are whole new levels to uh, strategy here that I hadn't really understood. So I had always said, you know, of course, let the miners figure stuff out because they're, uh, they, they have the immediate need to be profitable. Well, uh, unfortunately, uh, Bitcoin has never been miner controlled. They have that period to not only regain, but to totally replace their inventory, their capital. So that's a lot of money they have to earn and replace. So what I can do with my intelligence test is sort of collect people who are thinking and then I just have to, I, I have to leave the other people alone, right? But what can you do with mining? If you can perform intelligence tests with the other miners, you can, you can put the dumb ones out of business. You split, we bankrupt you. Right, because, uh, there is only so much total hashing power and the miners who are smarter can figure out how to assume the better position to get a little bit more profit. Women start getting into the community and, and earning because profit. Minorities because of profit. Profit is maligned by those who are already there and don't want competition. So I think that Enchain is basically an objectivist company. So uh, their whole business model is what is in our own interest. Let's start thinking about what that means. I think that Enchain is just a mining operation that has understood its own interest better than any other mining operation. And in order to know that, you just need an arbitrary uh, big brain that can, uh, can think about anything. I think Enchain is mining plus the brain, okay? They are the brain. They, they are just uh, being the brain. And what do you get if you have the biggest brain? A world that is more interactive where people have to start learning what each other is like. You split, we bankrupt you. So one thing you can do is perform intelligence tests. 
And you can use that to find who is thinking. So I do intelligence tests. They do intelligence tests. And another thing you can do is hypnosis, right? Because if somebody is smart enough to be able to do an intelligence test, then they can trick you. They can hypnotize you. So you have to watch my show because you know I'm smarter. Because I do the best intelligence tests. See? So Enchain is going to do that to the world. It's uh, rather crazy when you think about it. I saw the greatest intelligence test that I have ever seen in Bitcoin the other day. And that was this presentation by Jimmy Wynn. And so we need big blocks and we need them now. And there is an economic reason for that, especially for miners, to protect miner revenue. And miner revenue is important because miners have to be profitable in order to be incentivized to provide the computing power that runs the network and provides its security. If they're not profitable, they leave. But when I saw him, the first thing that I thought was, why is this person talking to Bitcoiners? Move away from being an environment where the different protocol developer groups had so much influence and sway over what happened with a protocol, a network, that is really supported by the money as well as the skin in the game of miners such as CoinGeek. And that is a key part of our vision for uh, Bitcoin SV, restoring and giving to miners the choice and voice in what happens with this network. This guy can communicate Bitcoin to the world, okay? So the Bitcoin Cash Network needs to scale big and needs to scale big quickly. It's stuff everybody in Bitcoin Cash agrees on. It never was allowed to fully flourish in its original design. And everything in it is related to the bottom line. Stability is so key for the big businesses of the world to use Bitcoin Cash so that it will grow. And he's saying things that some kind of normal person outside of Bitcoin would know is not bullshit. And that's important for big businesses because they want to create projects on a foundation that is solid rock, not sand. It shouldn't be moving all the time because otherwise the expense and time necessary to take a project or an application from idea to completion and release into the marketplace gets far more complicated. The talk is at kind of a, uh, a lower intelligence level, okay? Um, so I, I was a little bit patronized by it. Our message is simple. It's time for Bitcoin to grow up. So he's talking to you like he's talking to children. It never really hits a scaling ceiling. So even at the beginning of Bitcoin, the Satoshi vision was scale, scale big, scale bigger than the Visa credit card system, scale worldwide. Okay, but if he was facing outside, uh, normal businessmen from outside would be thinking, I, I think Bitcoin is is ready because this person looks normal and he is clearly not spouting bullshit. If we can get this restored to the original protocol and allow it to scale big, then it's easier. Nobody wants disagreements every six months. Developer groups don't, the miners don't, the businesses that operate on Bitcoin Cash do not. And so it is far simpler and more um, in conducive of a big inter enterprise approach to get to a stable protocol. So what's the intelligence test? What are you not noticing if you want to go against the SV plan? Storing and giving to miners the choice and voice in what happens with this network. They have that period to not only regain, but to totally replace their inventory, their capital. So that's a lot of money they have to earn and replace. Scale, scale big. You split, we bankrupt you. It's time for Bitcoin to grow up. Let's start thinking about what that means. Money, as well as the skin in the game of miners, such as CoinGeek. And that is a key part. If you want to make this global, then you have to engage globally. 
And Bitcoin is a cooperative system, right? And they're an objectivist company. So they've learned to present you with your own interest. Scale, scale big. And they've also thought about how to punish other miners who don't go along with them. Restoring and giving to miners the choice and voice in what happens with this network. You split, we bankrupt you. These guys are showing everyone that they have the biggest brain. And Bitcoin is a cooperative system. They're telling us how to cooperate. Who doesn't want to listen? Someone who doesn't know his own interest. Someone who doesn't notice when the bar has been raised. A protocol, a network, that is really supported by the money as well as the skin in the game of miners. This is a company that has learned diplomacy as part of its business model. It's easier. Nobody wants disagreements every six months. Developer groups don't. The miners don't. The businesses that operate on Bitcoin Cash do not. Restoring and giving to miners the choice and voice in what happens with this network. You split, we bankrupt you. So why wouldn't you go along with their plan? Connectivity in Bitcoin is incentivized. If somebody knows how to present everyone with their own interest in the cooperative system that is Bitcoin, where are they going to be? Connectivity in Bitcoin is incentivized. What can you do with people who fail the intelligence test? Well, you can ignore them in the next round, because you know they're on their way out. You split, we bankrupt you. How much hashing power do they have? Well, it doesn't matter, because all miners have to start thinking about this now. All miners have to think about Bitcoin, the economic system. All miners have to think about getting transaction fees. All miners have to think about how to fight other miners. Because they have to think about what does Enchain really know. Connectivity in Bitcoin is incentivized. How do you get to know what Enchain knows? How do you learn from Enchain? Storing and giving to miners the choice and voice in what happens with this network. All you have to do is accept something that is clearly in your own interest. Therefore, we need to begin the scaling process massively now in order for miners to maintain and grow their profitability. We cannot wait. Who do you want to join with? The people who don't know their own interest and therefore don't want to cooperate? Or the people who do? Connectivity in Bitcoin is incentivized. So they can do intelligence tests and they can do hypnosis. So what else can they do? Well, to me, it seems like the people at Enchain truly understand Bitcoin. You know, I normally tell people that nobody is a Bitcoin expert and everybody is constantly learning about Bitcoin. And of course, I, I believe that Craig Wright is constantly learning about Bitcoin himself. But to me, he seems like he could be the first real Bitcoin expert. Not, not only does, uh, does Craig Wright understand Bitcoin economically, but he also has a, a very deep intuition about it, which I know because he knows a, a similar trick to one I have been using. When the, the, uh, the cult formed and filled up all of Bitcoin with, uh, with retarded ideas, uh, we needed to build a new network. Connectivity in Bitcoin is incentivized. What my thinking was, well, what do I do? I don't know who to talk to. I, I don't know who, who is thinking. That's, that's what I wanted to know. And I, I knew we needed to build a network. And I had this idea that I would be at the center of the network. Uh, because I, I had the best understanding of Bitcoin. So I should be at the center of the network. That was my idea. Uh, so how do you do that? Well, uh, you put on antlers, okay? Uh, you use a costly signal that is difficult to ignore. So, um, and, and so, so proof of work is found in nature, right? Proof of work is everywhere in nature. Example, um, the, the bucks are all in competition with one another so they have to be efficient 
right? Because they're, they're in competition. So it's impossible for any of them to spend too much resources on growing antlers, right? Because they don't have lots of leftover. Because they have to be efficient, right? So the antlers are a costly signal and they are honest and they correctly tell you how strong the buck is. Uh, because if the buck wasn't strong enough, he couldn't grow antlers that big. So the way you do this to build the network is you show that you don't need friends uh, because friends are what you really need in the network. Those are the most important thing. So if you show that you don't need friends, that is a sign that you get friends easily. And what what's important, like what makes somebody valuable that would make them uh, win friends easily? Well, an understanding of how Bitcoin works. Because if you know how Bitcoin works, you can choose appropriate actions. And if you don't, then you're much more confused. My show is very demanding on the audience. Not only does it require a high level of intelligence, but uh, it's quite demanding on your attention. And uh, it's not as exciting as uh, our, our Bitcoin is. You have to be willing to, um, to be calm, and sometimes you have to listen to me uh, drone on for a while without getting to the point and sometimes I can act like a horror monster so it's basically nagging it's like nagging the audience aren't you going to say hello connectivity in Bitcoin is incentivized most people in Bitcoin need allies more than I do you know that you can't afford not to listen. So I could see that Craig Wright also knew that he had to build the network. And he, he was using the same trick I was to show that he understood Bitcoin and um, to, show, to show that he knew he was going to be at the center of the network. Because he would like do an entire talk that was like complete nonsense and there would be like one sentence right in the middle connectivity in bitcoin is incentivized so craig wright was acting like like a buck with uh really big antlers so i know that costly signals are honest and th so i knew that i would have to check out craig wright and i was concerned because i was thinking is he Mercer Popescu again? Now, Mercer Popescu, he was the original Bitcoin cult leader. And uh, he was one of the first people who really made me want to think about Bitcoin in new ways. You know, my friends and I always thought he was very funny and we liked him a lot. But he is also a cult leader. It, he had his group and he told the people in it that they were the elite. They were the elite of Bitcoin and Bitcoin was the elite of the world. And um, I could see how the people around him would get twisted. And, and it happened because of this lure that he gave them about being the elite. And that was the idea behind uh, MPEX having a a constant 30 Bitcoin price to register uh, regardless of what uh, what value this 30 Bitcoins had in dollars so originally the amount 30 Bitcoins would have been uh, very cheap uh, whereas now you know uh, most people couldn't afford it See, that's the idea. The, only the people who can get into MPEX are uh, the, the elite of Bitcoin, regardless of what size Bitcoin has. 
they're always the elite of Bitcoin. You know, and when I first saw MPEX, I, I was like, that's, that is so stupid. Why, why would you do that? But when I actually thought about what he was up to, I, I was like, I, I need to understand Bitcoin a little bit better. Mercha Popescu was the first person who I ever heard say that the block size needs to be small. And uh, I think this has to do with him, his idea that Bitcoin would be for a new elite of the world. So his idea was that MPEX was going to be like the elite of the elite. And you could only get in if you had 30 Bitcoins. Now, uh, Mercha was uh, the inspiration for my, my study of religion, which I, I have used in uh, the episodes of my show. Uh, because I, uh, I watched people around him turn into cult members. And there was one person in particular who was called a Bitcoin Pete, and uh, his blog is now at uh, Contravex.com, I think. And I, I watched his, his personality change into a uh, pathetic uh, Mercha clone as he, uh, as, he, um, as he interacted more and more with this group. And uh, seeing this uh, really distressed me a lot. So uh, his, his ideas affected me over time, and uh, they affected Bitcoin over time. The core cult that showed up later is kind of like a like a, a stupid version of his cult. So um, his his ideas eventually were uh, were transformed into a more uh, more popular form and uh, took over Bitcoin. And and something like that happened to me too because I invented Bitcoin maximalism and I was not thinking about the consequences because I wasn't thinking about Bitcoin being like some kind of liquid consciousness and I, th I think that for Mercha this small block size has to do with his uh, his concept that Bitcoin is for the elite because he's he didn't just want to be the elite of Bitcoin he also wanted Bitcoin to be for the elite of the world so um, it's not not for the masses. So keeping the block size small and making sure that there's a giant price for each transaction, uh, that's, uh, that was his vision of Bitcoin. And so I thought that this was stupid because Bitcoin being for an elite is inconsistent with Bitcoin having the maximal value. Bitcoin is only for the Illuminati, that that and other people can't use it. Uh, well, I mean, it would just be worth more if everybody else had some too, right? So, so wanting Bitcoin to be for the elite is like like wanting to be in the upper caste more than you want to be rich. And I was like, nobody. Nobody would be that stupid. However, I later saw that uh, many people acted like they preferred to be popular over being rich. That, to me, that's what the entire BTC core cult was. It was a popularity contest that had everything to do with how close you are to the core devs and uh, nothing to do with making Bitcoin more valuable. They're very interested in one another's position and uh, the value of that position is uh, how close it is to the uh, core developers. And, and in Merch's case, it was how close are you to him, right? But in the BTC cult, it's how close are you to the core developers. Posto, it's ex because they would get mad at you for having an opinion if you weren't high up in the hierarchy. And so, like, 
so stupid because this is also inconsistent with getting rich, okay? Uh, no hierarchy that excludes people is better at thinking than uh, everybody thinking together. A world that is more interactive where people have to start learning what each other is like. There was this amazing article that he wrote called A Call to Arms, which you should all read because it's fantastic. So first he says, compete with me. And when I read that, I thought that was great because uh, that means if he is a cult leader, you can just learn to be a better cult leader. It's perfect. So uh, now when he says compete with me, what he means is compete with him to be at the center of the network, right? Because that's what makes Bitcoin great, is the competition to get to the center of the network. Now when I saw that, when I saw compete with me, I knew that Craig Wright had tricked me into competing with him. Because now, now that I knew that that was his message, I saw that that's what he had done. And the way that this happened was when I, uh, when I started doing my show. If, if you look at the end of the Narnia episode, one of the things I say there is that my character is the investor. Yeah, he's, the, uh, he's the owner of Bitcoin. And um, so then I saw, I saw Craig Wright's uh, Satoshi thing. And I was like, he is not just going to take over Bitcoin just by pretending to be Satoshi. That's when I came up with the idea of the Emperor of Bitcoin character. Because I thought if, if there's anyone above Satoshi in the hierarchy, that would be the Emperor of Bitcoin. So, um, so that's what Craig Wright wanted. He wanted me to compete with him. And, uh, and that's, that's what happened. He tricked me. So whenever you analyze Craig Wright, you should always think about anything he says in terms of uh, how is this bringing him closer to the center of the network? Or is it? Has, has he uh, perhaps made a tactical error there? Because that would be a weakness that you could perhaps exploit to get to the center of the network yourself. Later he says, uh, he says he, he, he owns Bitcoin, and he says this is not to hodl, but to invest. There is a distinction. If you want to be rich, you must work. Okay, so, so I really like that. And uh, to me, that is sort of like something that uh, I wish I had said more earlier. Like, I agree with it. I didn't think that I had to say that. But I think that this is kind of like one of these things that the, the Bitcoin maximalists came to believe. And he concludes with an image of Atlas that uses the Satoshi Vision motif. And when I saw this, it occurred to me that Atlas Shrugged is the hidden message of this Jimmy Wynn presentation, isn't it? Because what I was thinking was, why isn't he out communicating Bitcoin to the world? See, it's Atlas Shrugged, because he's stuck in here talking to Bitcoiners inside. And here he says, when you think you know me, expect to learn that you must start again. So here's the kind of thing where, you know, people say, ah, oh, Craig Wright, he's a big phony. Well, I mean, how many other people are even saying what's important? You know, like, if, if you're trying to get to the center of the network, and all you've got is a bluff, well, and, and, and nobody else has anything better, then you get to the center of the network. To me, Craig Wright focuses on what's important. And if he's such a big phony, well, then it should be pretty easy to compete with him, huh? Okay, so in the middle of this article, there's a paragraph where he says, uh, people fear intelligence. They do this as they cannot understand it. Strength is simple to understand, but intelligence, drive, and achievement scare people. Well, it is time the world was scared. So this one is a little more amb ambiguous, but, but I think he got that from uh, my, uh, my episode, Strategy in the Core Cash Conflict, because that's, th that's what this whole episode is about. And, and emotionally, this paragraph kind of follows Strategy in the Core Cash Conflict, because it starts out where it's uh, me uh, droning on about issues in kind of an abstract way, and then all of a sudden it turns into a uh, horror scenario. So that's how he, he does it. He says, people fear intelligence. And then he's like, time the world was scared. 
I, I, I just thought I saw my, uh, my episode reflected in this paragraph, both thematically and its narrative structure. And uh, when you start to see my messages transmitted, that's how you know that you're close to the center of the network. Here, Craig Wright claimed that he had not seen this episode, but, but if he didn't, that means he came up with this independently. And if so, that means uh, we're thinking the same way, and uh, we, will, we will both uh, find this thought at the center of the network. So to me, Craig Wright really looked like the person that I was looking for here. So I thought, I'll make an episode that uh, is completely inconsistent with me being Craig Wright's cult member. So I, I made the Groucho episode. So someone going around imagining somebody as Groucho obviously can't be a cult member, right? Because Groucho is a comedy character. Like if you were, if you were thinking you don't want to really follow him. You, you want to decide whether you go along with anything that he says. And it's comedy because he easily hypnotizes the people on the, the movie. Uh, and they go along with him even if it's ridiculous. And they don't, they don't seem to notice that he's kind of uh, out of place in this party. So when I released the video, I got no response and to me that is the most interesting response and it's definitely the most intelligent response so say he said that the video was good and he thought it was funny and he liked it well the real message of the video is that I'm the leader isn't it so he couldn't do that if he did that that would make it look like he didn't see the real message of the video and what if he had said that it was bad and he didn't like it well, then, then I would win because of the Barbra Streisand effect, because that would just make my video more popular, and more people would want to uh, want to call him Groucho. They would want to pass on my joke, right? So Craig Wright didn't say the video was good, and he didn't say the video was bad, and you know what else he didn't do? Block me. So, so to me, this proves that he can handle uh, ideas that are different from his. And, and he's not afraid of different ideas, which is what he would be if he was a genuine cult leader. Uh, so when Craig Wright blocks you, that means that you've done something that he thinks is too stupid, and he just doesn't have time for it. And this also shows me that Craig Wright understands his own interest, because he knows that he needs to be connected, and he needs to be connected to the most intelligent people. You split, we bankrupt you. This is how Bitcoin works. Now, another thing that Enchain likes to do is make threats and act tough. And this was something that I always really, really liked about Craig Wright is his willingness to just be crazy. Uh, all of the best Bitcoiners are crazy. So I thought, why, why does Enchain have such complex behavior? Because they've got Craig Wright, who's just acting like a big jerk. The way that it was done was wrong. They put in replay protection and whatever else to make it separate and keep things separate. We're not allowing that. If someone tries to do that with ABC, we have more hash power. We will dedicate it to their hash power. There is no split. And they've got Jimmy Wynn with this very intelligent presentation that was designed with a, with a very high level understanding of Bitcoin. And the way that I know that is that this presentation has many audiences. It's talking to many different people at the same time. And remember, in Bitcoin, you need to be well connected. So this is a, this is a talk that was designed by someone who knows how to be well connected. Because the explicit audience is uh, the miners, and they specifically mention the miners and uh, not uh, not the developer groups. They they do not talk uh, directly to the developer groups. So who are they ignoring and who are they explicitly talking to? And this uh, this talk is also a message to people outside of Bitcoin. 
uh, they, they will see it and they will not grasp the nuance of what Jimmy Wynn is doing, but they will see they will see that Bitcoin is growing up and they will see Jimmy Wynn as a normal businessman that they can do business with. And I think another audience of this talk is the Bitcoin investors, because Jimmy Wynn is talking to investors just how they should be talked to. See, he is focusing on what fundamentally matters. He is focused on the most important things. He focuses on the bottom line. If you go back to my Narnia episode, remember at the end of that, I say, I don't want to be a dragon. I want to be Satan. Because dragon is a, that's a child monster, right? First I say, you, you should want to be a dragon. Then, then I say, well, I'd really rather be someone more like Satan. Well, I think these guys want to be dragons. You're better off if you're at the center of the network and you're a miner. So, and you need to be uh, good at uh, being in the center. You need to have some minimal level of competency of, of, of being in the center or you're out of business. So, uh, if somebody raises the bar a lot, uh, you know that everybody else is going to uh, have to follow uh, eventually. And if you don't notice, then uh, you don't know what it means to be a miner. How, how do you get to be good at being in the center of the network? Well, intelligence, just general intelligence, because uh, it is a, it is an eternal uh, churning of uh, of other brains who are also trying to get to the center. So it's an, it's an intelligence contest to be at the center of the network. So once you signal, once you signal that you're smarter, the other miners have to compete. Every second counts. Every second is part of your profit margin. Now. If you think about that for a minute, and you're investing hundreds of millions of dollars, the idea that maybe I should put a fast internet line in with low latency and high bandwidth, great, I shave a few seconds. Maybe I should buy a high-end server and use something like a Xeon Phi so that instead of taking three seconds to verify a large block, I now do it in 20 nanoseconds that becomes an investment. That 20K adds to my investment. So if you start seeing how this really works, the miners are incentivized so that they can compete that little bit better than everyone else to get better, faster, more interconnected hardware. And as they do it, they want to connect to more miners. So, uh, so this is what I see see Enchain as doing. They are uh, uh, they are creating a wake up call to the miners. You split, we bankrupt you. They're saying uh, we have the big brain, and uh, you need to replicate our business model, or else uh, other people will figure out what we've done first. Enchain is just showing people that they're more intelligent, and watching to see how you react to this watching to see who understands it first and he acts like he really likes to be a jerk how can he afford to do that how can he afford to act this way when he needs to be in the center of the network because he sees that Bitcoin is in danger that miner is going to actually undercut their own incentives and everyone needs to behave better. You split, we bankrupt you. Enchain is saying to the other miners, you'd better understand Bitcoin as well as we do, or we will turn your lack of knowledge against you. That miner is going to actually undercut their own incentives. And we have a great plan that is in everybody's best interest to follow. The Bitcoin Cash Network needs to scale big and needs to scale big quickly. It never was allowed to fully flourish in its original design. Jihan's whole modus operandi 
Yeah. He just wants to have many, many coins competing. He doesn't want global money. He just wants, like Hypo's exchange, to have lots of little shit coins. Craig Wright is putting himself in the position of having to be the greatest economist in history. A serious large-scale miner will spend well over $100 million setting up a system right now. Adam Smith sure didn't have hundreds of millions of dollars riding on whether capitalism is true, did he? The way that it was done was wrong. They put in replay protection and whatever else to make it separate and keep things separate. We're not allowing that. If someone tries to do that with ABC, we have more hash power. We will dedicate it to their hash power. How much hashing power do they have? Well, it doesn't matter because all miners have to start thinking about this now. All miners have to think about Bitcoin, the economic system. All miners have to think about getting transaction fees. All miners have to think about how to fight other miners because they have to think about what does N-Chain really know. N-Chain is saying this is the stuff that you need to be thinking about if you're a miner. And uh, now that we said it, you do need to start thinking about it because everybody who noticed is already thinking about it. Okay? All miners who are thinking will see this. And they will also see that they need to replicate Enchain's business model. They will see that Enchain is raising the bar. So they will want to go with Enchain's plan because it's easier to go along with Enchain and learn from them to try to replicate their business model than it is to try to recreate their knowledge. It's so obvious. Why didn't I think of N-Chain? Ah! So now I feel like I really wish I had got into mining. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if there was a miner that acted like it thought it was a Stephen King monster and it could just make you hallucinate whatever it wanted? And uh, when, I, when I said before uh, that I was looking for a gladiator, I didn't know what, what that meant exactly. I was talking about it in metaphorical terms. I, I, knew, uh, I, knew, I knew we needed something like that, but I didn't know what it was. Well, I think that Enchain is the gladiator that I've been looking for. If you know how to get to the center of the network, everyone has to listen to you, whether they like it or not. Is this man Satoshi? Who cares? I know who I think he is. John Galt. Before, uh, I was like, where, where is Satan? Okay? Um, cause Satan is the person who can cross the Sea of Chaos. So, uh, and what is at the other end of the Sea of Chaos? The Garden of Eden, right? And that is what Bitcoin SV is. The blob it creeps and leaps and glides and slides across the floor right through the door and all around the wall a splotch a blotch be careful of the blob beware of the blob it creeps and leaps and glides and slides across the floor right through